MPH Sports Podcast talks sport and property with sports people discussing their careers and how property played a part in it. Dean Bowditch, welcome to Talksport and Property. How are you? <laughs> I'm very good, Lee. How are you? Very good, thank you. Now, we're, we're actually recording this live in the office today, which is called cool. You're the very first guest to have been in here doing a podcast with. Looks really uh, good, mate. Looks really good. Thank you. Yeah, you're impressed. I can see you're in your golf gear. We're ready for a little, <laughs> uh, a little game afterwards. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, not played in ages, so I'll probably be terrible. But um, no, looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to being on the podcast. And um, I suppose... We're, we're all new to this, aren't we? So, um, yeah, yeah. It'd, be, it'd be really interesting. So, thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, you better report your A-game because we're playing against two of my brothers-in-law <laughs> today. So, uh, I don't want to be carrying I you around. I practised yesterday, Lee, and <laughs> I was terrible. So, hopefully, it will change. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, how is retirement? Because um, I love what you're doing on social media. I know you do a huge amount with the community and your ambassador role at MK Dons. How did that come about? A bit, bit of a strange one, really, because... I spent six years as a player at the Dons and I built some brilliant relationships with not just the chairman, but John Cove, Andy Cullen, who chief exec, you know, people like that, who I just, I just got on really well with. Like, mm. you know, the, the club have got like this reputation with the way they sort of formed and not a lot of people like them, but the people that work there are just brilliant people. So whilst I was there, I remember having a conversation with, with John Cove and he said, when you do decide to hang your boots up, just give us a call, you know? And, and you know that like sometimes when people say it and, you, and you, you don't know whether to take it as seriously, the truth yeah. or take it seriously. So when, when I sort of come towards the end, I, I called him. <laughs> I just called him and said, do you remember that time when you, uh, you said about <laughs> calling you? So um, yeah, no, I, I called him and he said, oh, like, thank you so much for calling me because there is an opportunity here to work within the community and within our charity sector and would, would you be up for it and I knew it was going to be almost like starting again but I snapped his hand off and said Let, let's go for it because whatever I do I, I do my best I know, whatever yeah. it is so mm. I took the opportunity and it was obviously right on my doorstep so it's been it's been really rewarding that's probably the best thing about it but um, no, I'm loving it good you've recently launched your own podcast would you mind sort of <laughs> Sharing us what it is and why people should listen to it? Uh, because it's got really good music. <laughs> <laughs> so just for the record, we helped Dean sort of initiate the idea of how to set this up. And yeah, you, you stole our music, didn't you? St- <laughs> you you without, stole without, our music. Without sounding like I'm lying through my teeth, <laughs> I hadn't listened to Lee's pod, this podcast and then we were setting up our own one. And Lee and Hannah were, were kind enough to send me over some stuff around about speakers and what websites to use and this, that and the other. And I went on this one website and I found this this intro music, outro music, that, you know. I thought, oh, that sounds really, really good. Like, I'm going to go for it. And I've we've done all these different sort of episodes and I've, I've, edited, and I've edited the stuff myself and I've really enjoyed doing it. And then <laughs> the first one came out and Lee went, that music sounds familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and it was exactly the same music. And on this website, it has thousands of music and thousands of sounds. 80,000 tunes and you picked the same one. And I picked the same one. So it sounds like I've nicked the music, so I do apologise. Right. We'll, it's, we'll it's, let you off. It's, What's it called? It's, it's called What It Takes To Be. So we, we speak with, at the moment, our first series is on, on football. So we've got like Russell Martin, Gavin Foxall, who's the, who's the chairman of Newport County. We've got more coming up, but I can't sort of announce at the moment because we're kind of letting people hang mm. a little bit on, on that. But it's all football managers, players, just to see where they've really, or, or what, what it's taken for them to get to and into the position they're in today. And it really fascinates me around mentality. Mm. You know, I struggled men- with my mentality, when I, especially when I was younger. And just to hear it from other people, how, how they dealt with adversity and how they dealt with certain situations, setbacks, trauma, you know, all those kind of bits that... You don't see when when you see people playing in the Premier League, you think, you know, that it was easy to get mm. there. You know, that what they've had to go through to get there really fascinates me. So that's what it's about. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I'm enjoying it at the moment. I'm doing it with a guy called Jack Sharp, who's a work colleague of mine, and he's currently doing a degree in sporting directorship. So he's really fascinated around the kind of the sporting world and what it takes to 
to manage a group of people and to get the best out of a out of a, either a football club or a sport a sporting environment. So yeah, it's, uh, I'm thoroughly enjoying it and long may it continue really. yeah I think it's a great idea and I, th- I wish you every success with it <laughs> just not so, just, it, well, don't worry we're not competing <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay well look you know you've listened to the pod or you're a fan of the pod and thanks ever so much for coming on so the first half we're going to talk about your career Dean and then we'll get on to my favourite subject which is obviously property but let's start with your career born in Bishop Stalkford 490 career appearances 95 goals 19 caps for England between 16s and 19s. I mean, you've also represented the badges of Ipswich, Burnley, Wickham, Brighton, Northampton, Brentford, Yeovil, MK Dons, Stevenage and Stowe Market Town. I mean, that's a lot of travelling. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take you back to where it all began in grassroots football, Dean. Where did you fall in love with the game and when did you get picked up by Ipswich? So yeah, many clubs. Thank you very much for that intro. <laughs> Just to point out, I was 10 games away from making 500 games, which absolutely devastated me. And I was five goals away from reaching 100. So the nearly man as well, I suppose you could call me <laughs> rather than the journey man. So, uh, but yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed my career and there was ups and downs as, as I'm sure we'll cover. But how I fell in love with the game was, I don't, I've got an older brother who's three years older than me. And he was always bigger, stronger, faster, quicker, better, you know. So I just wanted to be like him. So I was just following him around the house with a ball. You know, we, we used to play in the living room. We used to break all sorts of things. And it was just obsessed with it was probably the right right words, you know, and obsessed with being like him, I suppose. So when, when he sort of signed for Tottenham in the academy and went through the, the age groups, I wanted to be at Tottenham, but I didn't quite get there. So I ended up getting picked up by Ipswich for a school of excellence that I was a part of over at Brentwood. And whilst I was there, um, a scout came up to me and said, would I come and train over at Ipswich? So I said, oh, absolutely, yeah, of course I will, kind of thing. It was it was one of those moments where you know, Ipswich were doing well in the championship and obviously got a massive history and would, would I come along yeah yeah absolutely so went over there trained a few times and and it was just at the time when Ipswich's kind of satellites as a school of excellence were coming to a close mm-hmm. and they were changing into a, an academy so they were taking that plunge and making it kind of proper formal and this is this is where we're going to go and and they took they took on board all these players that were kind of a part of it at the time and I was one of them so I wouldn't say I was special or anything like that. I was just part of the group of players that they wanted to start this academy. But that love to be like but my brother, Ben, just continued. Even though he, I was at Ipswich, he was at Spurs. It was just like, what's he doing? He's playing for his country. He's captains his country. You know, that 16 to 19 age group. But he suffered loads of injuries. Loads and loads of injuries. And something that I've suffered with him in the past, but just he, he had like cruciate ligament injuries, double mm. break of his leg, you know big injuries whereas I was like a groin strain a hamstring strain kind of thing so I was always able to come back so as I sort of went through Ipswich that was it it was just what's Ben doing you know what's he doing at the moment I want to be better than him and that kind of that that was what gave me that drive to kind of stay out of training after everyone else you know just be a little bit different because if you if you went along with the crowd you know you that's what you'd end up doing just being I suppose not mediocre because that's the wrong word to say because we had some really good talented players in our age groups and above but you know if you set in your ways you, that that's what you achieve you know but if you're willing to just go that little bit further you know then the world's your oyster and at that time I wanted to play in the first team you know because my brother never got to that at Spurs but at Ipswich it was more attainable because mm. they were a championship site and as I was going through the age groups I was doing really well you know 13s, 14s, 15s, 16s, and I sort of suddenly jumped up into the 18s and into like the reserve team, and and I was only kind of 15. You know, so I took kind of a big leap, really, playing yeah. with big boys, and I was I was just a clever player, really, more than anything. And then yeah, and then I took that one one step further and sort of overtook my brother in making that sort of first team debut, really. But yeah, he was he was my as a as a child, you know, six year old. Well, actually, I was a five-year-old because I remember I couldn't play in his team until I was six. So at five, I was like, I want to play, I want to play, I want to play Ben, I want to play Ben. And the manager eventually let me play with my brother's team at, at the age of six. So 
that's where it started. Yeah. Well, it was that obsessive attitude that really got you your first team debut when you came off the bench against local rivals Norwich in a 2-0 home win at the tender age of 16, Dean. I mean, can you, can you talk us through that? I mean, that must have been such a special moment for you and your family. Yeah, it was, when I look back now, it's kind of, it's incredible really because at the time you don't see it like that. You know, it's kind of, I was 16 years old. I mean, I look at some 16 year olds now and it's like, how was I playing in front of 30,000 people? You know, not quite the biggest stage in football, but it was quite a big stage, you know. Not just that, playing against your bitter rivals (laughs) in Norwich. It was away from home, by the way, just to correct you. Oh, right. That's okay, fine. Sorry. I should have corrected you before. Wikipedia, yeah. mate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, and the, the, bit of the reason why I mention it is because a week before the game, I got a call up from Joe Rawl to say, do I want to come and train with the first team? I was like, well, yeah, of course I do. And I was sort of training with the likes of, you know, Jim Jilton, for example. Yeah. Incredible, incredible player. Absolutely. But not just that, his grit and determination, it just shone through. And I was a little bit scared of it, if I'm perfectly honest. So I went and trained with them and it was a great experience. Didn't expect anything from it. And then it was like, you're in the squad for the game. Christ, you know, what a step that is. You know, I've only been training for a week and now I'm in the squad. And then on the day, it was like, you're on the bench. I'm like, oh, what's going on here? Sure, this is, I'm like pinching myself going, this can't be real. Like I've gone from training to being in the squad, to being on the bench. And it was just enjoying the atmosphere. It was nil, nil, 30 minutes to go wasn't expecting anything and Joe's just gone you know go and get yourself warmed up you're coming on I was just sprinting up and down the line like this is just <laughs> too good to be true and there's a there's a picture that I always always I've got it up in the house somewhere but I always look back at it and Joe Royal's just patting me on the back of the head and I remember all he said to me was just go and enjoy yourself that was all he said actually he said go and enjoy yourself son and that was it and just sent me on the pitch they didn't even give me any instructions. It was really strange. They're like, you know, one of the biggest games of the season for them. And he didn't really say, oh, we need you here at set pieces or we need you here, 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 here. It was just, yeah. just can't enjoy yourself. I suppose it was the bigger picture though, wasn't it really? It was, you know, you can't put any pressure on a 16-year-old making their debut away from home with 30,000 people with your local rivals. It's a matter of just, just go out and enjoy it. Go and enjoy it. And that's, and that's what you say to all young players now. Like if you don't enjoy football, yeah. then you're in the wrong game. Yeah. And then when you get older, you start to take the responsibility of... Changing the game. Well. Yeah, yeah, changing the game or having respons- different responsibilities for your team. You know, you might, you might be sacrificed in a game because you've got a man marker player, but that's so important to the team. So you take it on board and, and, and it's kind of, I walked onto that pitch and I didn't really, I suppose I didn't really notice the fans. I didn't notice that I was just playing football in absolute dreamland, mm-hmm. you know, just getting on the ball, trying to sort of do something when I was on it. There was no pressure, like even the players in and around me, they wouldn't have a go at me because I was 16. It was like shouting at a minor. And then just in a, in a flash, I set up two goals, you know, and we won the game 2-0. I didn't expect what was to happen next. You know, the, all, every single newspaper across the UK on the back was my face. And it was like the next best thing kind of, and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't quite take it on board what was going on. And so the pressure then started to build over time. So it went from loving the game, wanting to just enjoy it, to I'm being compared to like Michael Owen and things like that. Come on. Like, it, it, I might have changed a few things when I was younger, but I just wanted to enjoy my football. So yeah, it was an incredible day. Incredible day. Wow. It's, it's nice to discuss this sort of thing because I had no idea about that. Yeah, and I think that's an incredible story. I'd imagine what your parents must have been like, where <laughs> nil nil, you've just come on and you've just changed the game. You've set up two goals. Um, were you at school at the time? Yeah. So, just to touch on that, you say about my parents. My 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 now wife was my girlfriend at the time. So I've been with my my wife all my life, and she was she had the flu, but she was so desperate to come to the game. She came to the game and she was like a shivering wreck. And I thought after the game, she was just like a bag of nerves, but she's like, no, I came down with a flu. I didn't want to tell you, but I came down with a flu. I didn't want to wow. worry you kind of thing. And she came to the game, she was white as a ghost, absolutely white as a ghost. But she was determined to be there to support me, whether I'd come on the pitch or not, but just to be there. And that's the kind of the moment where I think they all realised, everyone realised that this is the start of something. So, mm. 
And it clearly was. Mm. Well, look, the following season, you make your full debut against Walsall in a 3 1 win mm-hmm. before playing Watford on the Saturday. And it was in that game where you score a hat trick, becoming the youngest player of all time to score a hat trick for the club. Another <laughs> incredible moment, or have I got that wrong? No, you've got it. <laughs> Do you know what? You got it right this time. <laughs> and I, uh, <laughs> Yeah, wow. It's really nice to reminisce over things because you don't get to do it so often. So it's nice to sort of have, like, think about what my emotions were on a day. And well, I'd like to, I think, to remind you because I found the report on this one. I actually read it. Yeah. Because I was, I do take an interest. No, it's good. Um, on the third goal, you kiss the ball in front of the the home fans in the South Stand. Now, were you that confident? in your own ability at that age because at 16, 17 you're living the dream in front of tens of thousands of people you've just banged in a hat trick and you've kissed the ball and you've just embraced the moment haven't yeah. you it sounds like that way anyway yeah well, I don't, I'm not sure whether it was confidence based it was just because I was always very um, I said I said about before before we started the pod about around about mentality yeah. in the game yeah and not just in the game, but in people in general, it really fascinates me. And I always struggled with my mentality as a kid, you know, until I got a bit older and then I started to learn to deal with it and focus on the things I could control, essentially. But when I was younger, I used to get really, really, really nervous, extremely nervous, to a point where my legs felt like they weren't going to work. But then as soon as I crossed the white line, there was something in me that just, you just went and just got on with it. But I struggled beforehand. So I think kissing the ball was a little bit of like, relief that I'd actually done it and actually on that day live on Sky by the way so I'm in front of millions of people which again you don't really realise at the time but I still hear people talk about it today if I meet them for the first time be like oh I remember watching you on Sky like 20 odd years ago and it was like about this kid like I just got out and blow and I can't believe it myself I'm going yeah yeah, it was me kind of thing and I remember at half time I'd scored two before half time and Alan Armstrong who was an older player I'd taken his place essentially. I'd replaced him. I was the new kid on the block. He was the old guy. But he came up to me, he sat next to me, and he went, Make sure you go and get your hat trick. Is that what he yeah. said? And I and I kind of like I I felt like bad for taking his spot in a way. And that was in the Warsaw game. I'd replaced him because he had had a bad game a couple of games before. So I replaced him. Helped win the game there, then gone and scored a hat trick. And he was the one that came up to me, sat next to me, put his arm around me, and went, Now you go and get your hat trick. Unbelievable. And that's the kind of bit that you kind of go, your footballers sometimes get a bad rap, don't they? A bad, you know, but they're people at the end of the day, good people. Most of them are. And he was the one that actually sort of, and I think that was a little bit of the kiss of the ball. It was like, yeah, yeah I've yeah. done it. And I felt like he was like kind of looking at me going like, well done, mate, you've actually gone and done it. So yeah, another another incredible experience, but I suppose, yeah, one I'll, I'll never forget. Wow. Well, it was the same season that you also experienced the club's Academy Player of the Year. I mean, it's just a, a great start to professional football, really, wasn't it? Then, then the first sort of couple of years, I mean, you're still an Academy player. I'm assuming that you've not even signed a professional contract at this point. Uh, I had at 17, so yeah, but at 17, I'd signed my first professional contract, yeah. yeah. So uh, by that point, I knew I was kind of, I suppose, wanted, but also uh, they, I was a bit of a project for it, which as well to try and get mm-hmm. me to the levels they wanted. Yeah, the Dale Roberts Award was a great, a great achievement to win. Dale Roberts... Um, unfortunately passed away around about that time and they had this I suppose Academy Player of the Year Mm. or Young Player of the Year award made in memory of Dale big legend of the football club and I was the first winner of that award so it was kind of like it was quite an emotional day because people were were, you know were upset at the time because it was in respect of him and I'd won this award so I was kind of upset as well so I remember yeah I remember looking back going it was an amazing award to to win but the bigger thing the bigger message of that award was it was for Dale so yeah it was it was yeah another another fantastic start to my career really. I read that the following season life wasn't as perfect you picked up a few injuries and then between 2005 and 2009 you experienced six different loan moves with Burnley, Wickham, Northampton, Brighton on two occasions and also Brentford then why so many clubs and you could you talk us through maybe your experiences at each did you prefer some of the loan moves than others and, and what why why did you go out and loan as opposed to sort of staying with Ipswich Town to play football right 
I, th- I think I could make this answer extremely long, <laughs> but it was just to play football. I wanted to play men's football at the time. I was a, still a young boy. You know, you're referring to the ages between sort of 18 to 21. Yeah. You know, still a young, young man. But I wanted to play men's competitive football. Yeah. So when I was coming back and playing Ipswich in the reserves, it wasn't the same. Mm. You know, I wanted, I wanted points on the line. I wanted fans to be going to the pub after the game and talking about the game and how they've won the game and being excited. That was the kind of what I wanted to achieve. So every time that I came back to Ipswich and I wasn't getting the opportunity, I was, you know, knocking on the, you could probably put a sound effect in on that, but <laughs> knocking on the door of Joe Raw and saying, I want to play. And to be fair to him, he, he would always, and Jim Magilton, they would always kind of allow me to do that, you know, and just say, and almost respect the determination that I wanted to play football. So it seems like, you know, a journeyman kind of mentality, but they were all loans. There was all me just saying, no, 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 I, I can't come back and play reserves. I have to go and play men's football. So I was just constantly going to these different clubs, gaining an immense amount of experience on the, along the way at such a young age. Every club I went to, I learned something. I think that was the biggest thing about it. So yeah. Cut a long, long, long story short. It was it was just about playing playing competitive for, for me. So do you do you feel then looking back that the injuries you picked up that following season just dented your progression to establish a place in the first team? Yeah, absolutely, right? yeah. I don't. I, I would never use it as an as an excuse. Yeah. Because could I have done a little bit more to help prevent those injuries? I look back and think no, I couldn't have. I would always do what I was asked of plus a little bit more. That was kind of my mentality. So if someone asked me to do 10 squats, I would probably do 11 mm-hmm. just to push myself. But sometimes that would also be a detriment to, to, to me because I would maybe push my limits probably a little bit too far, then I'd get injured. You know, and that was kind of maybe if I'd known how to manage my body a little bit better as I did towards maybe the latter end of my career, then I might have been able to then push into a first team environment at a younger age and sustain that. Yeah. But yeah, I've just, I suffer, I mean, I've spoken about this to a few different players in, in the past, good friends of mine, and we've said, I, we truly believe that physically you're either made to play football or you're not, you know, and if you're made to play football, you see these players that just, they, they'll, they'll finish their career and go, I was very lucky, I never got injured. And you're like, yeah, I think you, you're extremely lucky to have a, physical makeup to allow you to play football. Dean Lewinson, for example, mm-hmm. 800 games at one club. He's never been injured. And if he, he was, sorry, he was injured once, hyperextended his knee, should have been out for three months. He was out for two weeks because his body was just able to deal with it. He's the Whereas fullback at... The fullback at MK Dons, yeah. yeah. He's at 800 games. Just just type in Dean Lewinson yeah. and you'll see. He's, he's, he's achieved incredible things, but his body's allowed him to do that. Mine didn't. Yeah, mine's made of glass, <laughs> but I've had to manage it as best as I could throughout my career, which is why when, when you said 490 games, 490 of them have pretty much been me managing my body to get on the pitch mm. to complete as many minutes as possible. But that comes with a, a mentality of wanting to do it as well. So yeah, it has it, it, I won't use it as an excuse because I don't think it is, but it's definitely been part of my career that I've had to accept yeah. and also manage to, to get as many games as possible. Sure. Well, look, your time at Ipswich came to an end in 2009 and you signed for Yeovil Town. A move that you wanted, I assume? Yeah. Would I say it was a move I wanted? Not not necessarily, but it was needed. Okay. So Roy Keane came in at the back end of the 2009 season mm-hmm. and we had 13, 14, 15, something around about that players out of contract he got rid of all of them bar one I think and he was his way of shaking things up fresh start totally accepted it you know and I remember sitting in an office with Roy and, and he almost said that I've had numerous conversations about you Dean and we all feel like all of the academy managers it's like everyone that's dealt with you we all feel you need to move on now it's like I was part of the paintwork but I was at that point where I felt it as well, even mm. though it was extremely upsetting and I cried for a couple of days because it was my, ch- my childhood club that I played for. Um, it was desperately needed. And it was the first time that 
I remember I, I listened to Fraser Franks uh, more recently, who's been on the pod, and he talked around about a professional footballer having to then go on trial mm. at a club, mm. and it is a risk that you take, but sometimes you need to do it to just prove I'm still a good footballer. Can you sign me, essentially? So I went to Notts County after being released first, and I remember training there for a week, and the balls didn't come out, we just ran, because it was pre-season. And I thought, right, well, I haven't really proved, <laughs> all I've proved I can run. I, can't, I haven't proved that I can play football. And then Yeovil, who, because Notts County were in League, League 2, and Yeovil in League 1, I always wanted to try and stay as high as I could for as long as I could. So Yeovil came and said, come down, uh, we'll have a look at you, essentially. And it was um, Terry Skiverton and Nathan Jones who were in charge at the time. And I went down there and I was just, I, was, I just felt like I was better than most of the players there. But not, not in an arrogant way, but like technically better. I felt like I was a little bit fitter than most of them. And that just come from the standards I'd come from and the standards I set myself. I just felt like I could fit in straight away. The bit that was going to always get in the way at Yeovil was the physicality of going down the leagues. I wasn't, and I still aren't, I'm, I'm sort of just under six foot, you know, like a bean pole when I was that age. And I filled out a little bit as I went through my career, but I've always been slight and kind of people would, I suppose, call me a little bit weak, but I was weak physically, but I made up with that through my mentality and my awareness and positioning, technique, things like that. I made up for it with that. So I've gone to Yeovil, proved myself in a, a week or so to say, yeah, we need to sign him. Signed for a year and got essentially battered. You know, but it taught me a hell of a lot. And I know you've got a, another question around about um, sort of my first game at Yeovil, so I can. Yeah, well, I mean, you scored on your on your debut, but then you got injured yeah. again. I mean, it's yeah. just so frustrating, isn't it? I mean, well, that's that's what you... I was going to allude to. Is, right. is I've I've just been released by my boyhood club. Yeah, gone and trained, earned myself a contract absolutely flew in pre-season scoring in all the pre-season games like manager was like I want you to be the man this year essentially and it the boost it gives you when oh, the manager mass- says that massively. it's just like I want you to be the guy kind of thing so I thought here we go this is it first game of the season scored in the game and then I pushed a ball past someone and I was sprinting full, full tilt I mean I wasn't the quickest but I was sprinting full tilt <laughs> And this guy, I can't remember who it was now, but he clipped me from behind and I fell awkwardly on my arm and dislocated my shoulder. And I just remember at that point, looking down, my shoulder was just where it shouldn't be. And it was just like it hit me that I put all that work in to get a contract, to almost start restart my career, first game, and I know it's going to be a long-term injury. And I remember coming away, I was quite upset, went to hospital, uh, managed to get the shoulder back into where it should be. And then they basically, within a couple of days, said that I'm going to need an operation on my shoulder. Um, Otherwise, it'll keep dislocating. Didn't really want that, (laughs) if I'm perfectly honest. And I was up for three months. And I thought, I could either go one or two ways. I could either just, you know, I suppose, mope around and be like, oh, it's my career done now. Or I can put the bit between the teeth again in the gym every day, you know, pushing my limit. I remember, I remember with my shoulder, anyone that's listening who's had a shoulder injury, to, for the first like two months, to, to lift your arm even a little bit is extreme agony. I couldn't wash my armpit for like about six weeks, seven weeks. So I absolutely stank, <laughs> but I couldn't lift my arm. But I just remember every day in the shower, I'd get my arm and I would be pulling it to try and pull my arm up essentially and I was like almost crying in the shower because it hurt so much but I was just desperate to get it to a point and eventually obviously then it starts to loosen up doing all your exercises every single day and it's still now I still get pains in my shoulder now because I was just so desperate to get back so I probably went back a little bit too early but it was just one of those again a mentality thing it was just I could either crumble or I could push again and and get myself back and I, I, I did manage to finish top goal scorer that season and it was again it was the restart of my career from there on yeah your resili- resilience attitude definitely has shown through not only at Yeovil but obviously they, they offered you a new deal there but you were also given the opportunity to sign for MK Dons under Carl Robinson mm. what made you sign for Carl and were there other options available to you at the time Dean? Um yes 
There were, because the second season at Yeovil, I finished top goal scorer again in a team that were battling relegation, scored 15 goals, which is a good return mm. for essentially a winger. <laughs> so I've done pretty well. And I had a few different clubs that wanted to take me, but they were all around about the same level. And I remember talking to randomly from my agent, as Alan Pardew. He said, would you consider staying at Yeovil for one more year? to almost kind of score 20 goals, 25 goals, and then you get a bigger club. But when when I was sitting in the summer making these decisions, like Yeovil had offered me another contract. I've not got bad words to say about Yeovil. I actually loved it down there. I felt like I left on good terms as well because they know what it's like to be down there and they know if a big club comes in, you, they just know to exactly. let their players go, essentially. Yeah. And I remember John Gorman picked the phone up. John Gorman was the manager at Wickham when I was on loan there. Spent a few really good months under John, built a really good relationship with him. And he was assistant manager at MK Dons and he, he called me and just said, would I come to MK? And I played there a couple of times and the stadium is incredible. 30,000 seat stadium, state of the art stadium, you know, really, really nice place to go and play your football. But it wasn't necessarily that, that made me want to sign, it was John. It was, it was the way he spoke to me on the phone, you know, the way he sort of said, look, you've done so well this year. You know, I knew, I could see it when you was at Wickham, you was going to do that. It was the way, it was just the way he made me feel and I just went, I've got, I've got to go there. I have to. So I went over and had a chat with, with Carl, who again, just sort of cemented that decision to go and play. He just, he knew how to man manage people and he did throughout my whole six years there. And then seeing Pete Winkleman as well, he came down because he would go and see every single player that they signed <clears throat> and have a conversation. And he, t- he would tell you about the history of Milton Keynes and, you know, how they want to go from one step to another. And, uh, you know, and not just as a football club, as a, as a, as a city. To be a part of that is, is essential for this moment in time. It, was, it just felt like it was, I can't not sign it. So yeah, I just, I, I signed on the dotted line and, I felt then, even though it was the same level in League One, I felt like I had taken a, a, a step forward and then it was either going to be, I'm going to be here now for almost the rest of my career because I just seem to fit in really well or in a two or three years time, I'll have another move in me. And it obviously worked out that I've managed to sort of spend six wonderful years at the Dons and um, enjoyed pretty much every, every minute of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to sort of talk about your first season there because it, it clearly was the right decision. Managed uh, 15 goals, 13 assists, top of the assist table for that season. I mean, you mentioned Carl and John, but you also become a real sort of fans favourite there as well, didn't you? But yeah, I mean, can you talk us maybe a bit more through that? Because, uh, I mean, after six seasons, you had like, 227 appearances, 48 goals before signing for Northampton. What special moment? was there back in your six year tenure at, at the club that you can really sort of look back on quite fondly? So yeah, like you said, touched upon there, first season was a great start. You know, I'd signed a two year deal with a, with an option. Okay. In the first two years I was top goal scorer. Yeah. I was joined in the second with Ryan Lowe, but I felt like my return on goals and assists, I would always return at least 20, 25 goals a season. I was always an unselfish player as well, so that, that number could would, should have really been more. But the amount of times I would do the graph for the team, you know, it was far outweigh me being selfish and just going it, trying to be like the maverick. That just wasn't my personality. So there was plenty of games in there where it ended up me just being working together with, say, Dean Lewington on the left side, like their threat is down the right. So let's just stop that, stop that threat for the team and let the other players go and win the game. So there was a lot of that. I felt like it was a proper team culture as well under Carl. You know, we had some top players throughout the team, Dave Martin in goal, Darren Potter in the middle of the park, Louis, like I touched upon. Then we went into like our promotion season, which was probably the highlight of my time there with, with Delhi playing, Delhi Ali playing midfield, Will Grigg up top, Benek Fobe just banging in goals left, right and centre. Carl Baker, who was like the probably the best player of the season that season, who played at Portsmouth, Coventry, came to us and was just incredible. I mean, I, I, I do wonder how I managed to make the team, you know, because I see some of these players that played and just thought, 
I feel privileged to be in, on the same pitch as them. And I remember talking to Carl about it after after I left, and he said that team that season could have performed at the top end of the Championship, bottom bottom end of the Premier League, with some of the players that we had. Wow. But we were in League One, and even though it was a bit topsy turvy at the start, the way we finished was like we were playing like a Premier League team against these these teams, battering them. You know, but doing it professionally as well. It was it was just fantastic. So to get promoted and again on on the last day of the season as well, it was kind of big big season for me both on and off the pitch. And it just was so nice to be able to get over the line and hit the championship. You mentioned Delhi. How good was he back then? Did you think I'm playing with a potential England star here? No, no. And I'll tell you why. So. He was 16, 15, 16 when he came and trained with us first. And he came in with a, a kid called Brendan Galloway. And Brendan went and signed for Everton. And I think he's at, where is he now? He might be at Luton. But anyway, he's, he's, he's had a decent career himself. But they came in together and Brendan was better. Brendan was the one that we all looked at and went, this kid's going to be mustard. You know, fit as a fiddle good on the ball like could put a cross in as well he was a left wing back he just would run for days like run like a horse kind of thing it was unbelievable but then he was just sort of in the shadows just kind of get muscled off the ball you know we didn't think anything of him I'll be perfectly honest you know some of the, like, the more senior ones like I was getting to a point where I was kind of like mid-twenties was doing well so I had a voice as well and I'm kind of like saying to some of the lads like he might be with us for long <laughs> and then uh, and Carl just put his, his trust in Dell and came on a few times made loads of mistakes kept on like costing us games and that was the season before we got promoted and we finished like 12th 11th something like that and not saying it was all down to Dell because like, that's, that's harsh on him but like he made loads of mistakes but I felt like that was part of his learning and I think Carl was willing to accept that we might not be the team this year that's going to get promoted, but secretly thinking, let's bring some of these kids in, let them make the mistakes so that next year we kick on. But it's all a test, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you were given that test when you were 16. Yeah, I guess then he was given yeah. these tests at 15, maybe he just wasn't ready at that particular no. moment. No, and he wasn't. He wasn't ready until he came back in pre-season. Really? And... I remember saying to Dell, I was like, mate, what have you been doing? Like you've you've doubled in size for starters, both physically, like muscle yeah. muscle wise and height. He yeah. just suddenly shut up. And he just made me laugh because he went, nothing. He literally <laughs> he just had a growth spurt. That's all he had over the space of like six weeks. It was incredible what happened to him. But he had secretly, like without really telling us, for about pretty much the whole summer, but for like four weeks leading up to pre-season, he was just running. He was doing loads and loads and loads of running, which probably helped him build his muscle mass and things like that. And he came back and he was just head and shoulders above everyone. Every single running session would be top of the list, but not just top of the list, but like way ahead of anyone else. But the bit for us that kind of cemented his place in our team, because that's how we felt as players. It was like, you need to break into this team and then we'll accept you in a yeah. way. It was in a training session. Darren Potter got on the ball, one of our best midfielders we've had at the club in our history, is, is my opinion. And he got on the ball, would never lose the ball, Potsy, and he's really strong on the ball. Delhi came in, was on the other team, clattered him, absolutely clattered him, came out with the ball and ran off with the ball. Potsy just got up really casually, started jogging over to Delhi. I thought, he's going he's gonna <laughs> to smash him, he's going to whack him, right? He put his arm on his shoulder, he went, that's more like it. Did he? And then ran off. Wow. A little bit like the Alan Armstrong oh, yeah. kind of story. And he kind of just almost that was the acceptance from everyone else as well. It was like Potsy's just kind of accepted that. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes for him to get in this team and then to kick on again. And it was like from that moment, then he kind of went, All right, that's what I need to do. And then he just, just It's funny, isn't it? Because straight. you talking older and wiser, you still remember that, but I wonder if he does. Because be interesting, he, yeah. It would be interesting. interesting because I don't he probably, probably doesn't. Does. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> You're like, what's he talking about? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but even if he he doesn't realise that, that was probably quite a career defining moment. A bit like what happened with you with yeah. your hat trick, with what yeah. had happened. But that was probably something that is easily missed. But yeah. something that if you ask, if I remember it quite 
quite vividly. And I'm sure if I mentioned it to some of the other players at the time, like Potsy, probably even would go, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that when he'd done me in training. Did I do that? And I went, yeah, you actually accepted it. And that was the point I think he realised this is, this is me now. I've, I've yeah. got to do this in training and games and, and kick on from there. Well, I've completely forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> no, that, I was, that's that's a what, great story. Do you know, what's, what <coughs> that's what, a really good do you know story. what I love as well is that I like to use Delhi now when I'm speaking with young players. Yeah. Because I had a career and I had a, a thoroughly enjoyed my career. But I feel like when you're talking to young players, you need to be relatable and, and relevant to the, this moment in time. So to speak about Delhi and to say, I played alongside him, I've seen him come through, you know, this is what he's done. You know, I've done this, but this is what he's done. Mm. And he's got to play for his country. He's playing Champions League. He's mm. like, yeah, Champions League final and things like that. It's kind of, sometimes you've got to almost come away from your own experiences and use others. And Delhi's a great example of that. And um, I'll be using that for many years to come, I'm sure. Oh, I think that's a, a great way to kind of end in the first half of the pod, mate. That's 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 brilliant. And and I think what you do with the community work, by the way, is, is absolutely first class. So if anyone wants to continue to actually watch how you represent the club and some of the great work you do, where should they follow you? Probably the best thing is to, to have a little look on social media. So yeah. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, you know, they're, they're all platforms I'm on, but I would, I would just, I would recommend going on to our website, which is www.mkdonset.com. That's set.com. And just have a little look at, many clubs do it. Mm-hmm. Many clubs have the community engagement side of, of, of it, but just to have a little look at, it's not just always about football. Yeah. There's other things that we try and help, help people in our community. Fantastic. Okay, well, this is the part of the pod where we're going to go into a quick 10 question fire round. Dean, question one. Who do you support? Tottenham. Such a shame. <laughs> Such a shame. <laughs> Two. Would you like to coach or manage one day? Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, I'm, it's not my path at the moment. Okay. But I do, I do still love football and I want to help people, so maybe. Good. Who was your boyhood hero? Teddy Sheridan. Was he? Oh, yeah. And the thing is, I've had the pleasure of meeting him a few times now, and there's always that danger of meeting your hero. Yeah. You know, what's he going to be like? Yeah. Just a all round top guy. Yeah, Fraser yeah. said that on the pod the other week. Top, actually, top guy. In his class. Yeah, he did. Yeah, yeah, he touched upon it. And I've met him a few times in, away from a working environment as well, and sometimes you can see the real, the real person. Yeah. and. Yeah, he's... Um, what a player he was. What a he? guy, what a guy. Best player you played with? Delhi, Delhi Ali, yeah. I, it's, a, it's a real easy one for me because I've played with some top top players, especially Ipswich as well. And even players like Louis, you know, I know he's a good friend of mine, but when you watch him, technically he's very good, but standout performer to play to play with. And uh, I've, like I said, I've played with a few good ones. Um, <laughs> Delhi, Delhi definitely. The best player you have played against? Funny enough, I've been asked this a few times recently, since, especially since I've retired. Yeah. And I was wrecking my brains at the start going, right, I've, I've played in this game, I've played in this game, I've played in this game. But I always come back to one player and we played Chelsea in the Cup in 2015, 16, I don't know, five or six years ago. They put out a top team. You know, I played up front against John Terry and Gary Cahill, right? And I did not get a touch, basically. They were unbelievable. But in that team, there was a young man called Eden Hazard. Oh, my God. Oh, my gosh. He was ridiculous. I mean, no one could get near him. And when they did, like, he just bounced up, bounced away. He should have scored about 12 goals. It was just... He was exceptional. And to, to see it in real life, not just from the stands but from eye level how good he was in his prime when at Chelsea oh incredible yeah it was a blue day when he decided to leave the club yeah um, what was the score by the way we lost 4-1 there you go <laughs> <laughs> a club you wish you had played for but never did uh, oh nice question I suppose I was offered a chance to go to Man United when I was 14 15 and I turned them down because I felt like my path at Ipswich was more likely to get me first team football. Again, just I wanted, even from a young age, competitive men's football. And I thought, will I get that at Man United? Regret that one? Um, no. 
No, I, I, no. I only have one regret in football. And that was not going away with the England under 19s for the European Championships to pursue my first team career. Oh. I wish I hadn't. Yeah. I wish I hadn't rejected my country. You know, that was the big, the worst decision I could have ever made. Favourite goal you scored, Dean? My... Oh. Doesn't necessarily have to be the best one. That's what I mean. Your favourite one. I think... Do you know what? A last minute goal or... A... I've, I've scored no, I've scored probably every type of goal you can think of like some absolute worldies which I didn't expect myself you know headers which again wouldn't expect me to score a header but one goal that again I think when you retire and people ask you these questions you seem to revert back to actually one and you you, you back it and you go yeah actually that was my favourite goal and it was a penalty which again no kind of like specialty about it wasn't even a good penalty if I'm perfectly <laughs> honest but it was the, the occasion, it was AFC Wimbledon when I played for MK Dons. And for those of you that understand football, the rivalry between MK Dons and AFC is quite bitter to a point where they don't even recognise us as a football club. They just call us, they call us players and team. They don't call us by our name. So we were going for a bit of a bad run back in 2000 and what would that have been, 16, 17. Uh, Robbie Nielsen was in charge. We'd lost... Like three or four in the bounce. It wasn't looking good. We played AFC and I think that was their moment to go, we're going to beat them, we're going to thrash them. And I got a penalty in like the 65th minute and I swear, like, I, I couldn't even imagine having like the whole country on your back playing for England in a World Cup final. But that's what it felt like. I had all these players, staff, fans, like, weight all on my shoulders and I felt it as well I didn't like block it out I was literally shivering <laughs> taking this penalty but I took responsibility and I thought if I, I will take it and I'll take it on the chin if I miss but I scored and we won the game 1-0 so yeah that was probably my, my favourite goal I actually recall us talking about this in the long car journey once yeah. and, and I remember feeling all sort of nervous and, and butterflies yeah. at the time as well so uh, <laughs> I was hoping you were going to share that story today yeah so there we go, go. There go. <laughs> what job would you have done if you wasn't a footballer what would I have done probably something in property Lee good <laughs> <laughs> and lastly what is your golf handicap that you'll be playing off the side <laughs> Dean? <laughs> I'll be playing off 18 Right. Yeah, shot, shot a hole. Well, I, need, I, des- I desperately need a shot as, hole at the moment. As you're on my team, you can go as high as you like. <laughs> I'll go 24 then. <laughs> Talk Sport and Property Podcast, sponsored by MPH Sports Property Academy. Download the app today from the App Store or Google Play by typing in MPH Sports, the trusted go to app for sports people looking to buy or learn about property. Okay, welcome back, Dean. I know you are married, also a very proud dad, but I'm intrigued to know how was retirement for you and how did you prepare for that? Reti- retirement for, for any player is tough, you know, and, and I didn't really announce it. I didn't announce it on socials or I didn't announce it to my friends and my family knew I was going to sort of hang my boots up, but I wasn't one to sort of have the, the plaudits and the kind of the pat on the back or anything like that. I just wasn't really my, my cup of tea, but... It was different for me retiring because it coincided with the birth of my son. And that was that was kind of, for the last 10 years, we've been desperate to have children. And it's been a little bit more difficult for me and the wife. When we eventually conceived and we were waiting on this little man to turn up, football just took a massive back step. Massive, massive back step to a point where I could have retired, you know, on the day he was born and I would have been happy. I try to play a little bit at non-league level at Stone Market and I appreciate them sort of taking me there for a little bit, but it wasn't the same. I didn't have that drive and that determination and I probably didn't have it so much at Northampton either at the back end of my career because he was, the process we took, he was getting close. So it was like my focus was fully on my son or a baby, should I say, a family. So the transition was like, and we've had, you know, we, we sort of met sort of as I, as I did come away from football and it was like, I was, I accepted it. I was happy because I had a family, you know, and I, and that was all I wanted like for the last, like I said, 10 years. So to finally get that, it was, that was an achievement in itself. So football could end and I would be happy with the career, but this is my next step now. This is, this is my next goal is to make sure that he has a, 
has a has a good life, he's healthy, and we kick on from here, really. Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, we, we did meet shortly after you retired, and you were quite open and into mentioning me, to me at the time that uh, the properties that you had acquired during your career were rented out. And that, for the first time, because you were unemployed, it was actually the rent that was paying for your mortgage and yeah. feeding your newborn baby. Feeding I mean, baby, how, yeah. I mean, was that quite scary at the time? I know we've spoken, but obviously we've been able to the pod. But yeah. Was that quite worrying? And for the first time, how did unemployment feel? Well, I'll answer, I'll, I'll answer, I'll answer that first. So yeah. unemployment f- didn't feel that that it didn't feel that bad to me because I was with you my son. It with your son, yeah. you know, I was with him every minute of every day, along with my wife. You know, we were doing our utmost best to make sure that he was. I mean, he caused me many, many headaches. Don't get me wrong, and he still does. But <laughs> you know, we were willing to blood, sweat, and tears to make sure that he was brought into this world properly. From that point of view, unemployment didn't even come into the the mind process, if yeah. you know what I mean. But yeah, we sort of came, I suppose, into contact through through property essentially, and it sort of started from when I was when I was seventeen, eighteen, signed my first professional contract at seventeen, and along with that, it was a three three year deal. I think it was every year you got like a signing on fee essentially, or it was a signing on fee that was split over three years. And at that age, it was a substantial amount of money, an amount of money that I wouldn't know what to do with it. I wasn't educated in property. I wasn't educated in finances. But thank God my mum and dad were. And they had property as well. So they, my dad's a self-employed gas and heating engineer, got his own business. On the side, they had a couple of properties, but for a similar reason to the, what I saw it as eventually. And it was... It's almost it's almost like a savings account having property that you can call upon when you need when you really really need it. It can be a source of income as well, which is even better. But I always felt like as soon as my mum and dad said put it in property, and I'd be like, why? I want to spend it on a car or something. And they were like, no, 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 you need to set up for your future now, kind of thing. So you don't trust anyone more than your mum and dad. I'd, I'd assume most people are the same family. So I put all that savings, all that signing on fee, into buying my first property. And then the year after, I bought another property. And then the year after, I bought another property. So it was like three years on the bounce, I bought three properties. I had three by the time I was 19, 20, which is not really heard of, is it, really, in, in kind of this day and age? No, so, it's not. And that comes down to loads of different things, like property prices and things like that. But there are ways that you can still invest in property without having to worry about that. So that's the kind of, that's the bit where... Lee, that's the bit where you come in. But it's kind of, when I then sort of came away from football, I had this income that originally had repayment mortgages. So I went on to interest only and had this extra income that was helping pay my own mortgage. It didn't fully replace my income from football. But it helped. But it enough helped because it just took a little bit of worry off my shoulders to say, right, okay, at least my mortgage is paid. Mm. Now all I need to do is maybe dip into a bit of savings to help put food on the table for a bit until I get a job. Then once I've got a job, that replaces that. And then there's probably still a little bit left that I need to replace. But property has helped me massively it really did, to achieve it? that and just take that strain away from that transition. And it actually helps that transition become a little bit longer mm. because if you've got a set amount of money in the bank that you don't have any income, but you've got that amount, that will only last so long. But if you've got a, a steady income stream on top of that money in the bank, you know, that transition can last that little bit longer to get you a job. But it's kind of, yeah, I'm a massive, massive believer in, in trying to get on the property ladder as, as quickly as you can uh, from an early age. So. Yeah. So how, how many do you have now? I mean, uh, you mentioned the three that you bought at yeah. 18, 19, 20. I know you've obviously got your family home as well. Did you keep the four? Did you buy any others during your career? Do you know what? I would have loved to have been able to buy more. Mm. When I was at Ipswich, I got this money, no mortgage, wasn't paying mum dad anything, you know. So it was suddenly like, yeah, living at home kind of thing. So it was like, I've got all this spare cash. Let's put it into property. So I did. Then I went to Yeovil, like 60, 70% pay cut. Couldn't afford to buy a property, Lee, to be perfectly honest. But I've got this money that, and I, and, I'm, 
And mum gave me the best bit of advice I could get in property that for as long as you can afford to have a repayment mortgage because you're ch slowly chipping away at your capital, chipping, 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 so that as you're chipping, property prices are going up. So it's making that, I suppose, that divide between the two bigger, so it gives you more equity. So it kind of makes you think, okay, well, that's helping me in the long run until you can't, and then you change to interest only. And that's what I've done, essentially. But even whilst I was at Yeovil, I could afford because I had uh, tenants in there that were paying my mortgage, essentially, still are. I could afford not to worry about that. Then I went to MK and suddenly I was on a little bit more money, but still not replicating what I had at Ipswich. Because now I'm at MK, I've got a mortgage, I've got bills to pay, I've got... So I never really had enough money to buy another property. So I didn't. I suppose what... Is that... Sorry to interrupt, but is that because you thought that you were already... You were looking at your local market and where you were based. And yeah. you were thinking, well, actually, if I would have had a bit more knowledge about other areas across yeah. the UK, if I'd have had some maybe sort of 25 grand, I could have bought something else. But I was probably thinking I needed 50 mm. or 60. 100%. I, 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 yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it because when I said before around about when players are younger and there are ways, like when you come in, there are ways that you can use smaller amounts of money to still purchase property and have yeah. a steady income. I was probably more focused on Milton Keynes, you know, London, not far outside of London, where you need not 50, you need more than 50 to get yourself a, a buy to let property. It's yeah, just. Well, it's, it's normal, isn't it? It's it, normal. You look at your market, you're looking at your phone, you're yeah. looking at local property prices, you're looking so at I never the felt, windows. I never felt like I could take the next step and buy another property. And then I actually ended up losing a property through our decision, and it wasn't. Don't worry, it wasn't anything like I lost it through uh, whatever. I moved house in from uh, a new building in Milton Keynes to an older house to renovate. But I needed money to renovate. I didn't have it in the bank, but I had it in a property. So I sold a property to have uh, equity <coughs> in it. And I sold that to do the renovation on my family lifelong home, yeah. you know, which I now have in Milton Keynes. So... That's another bonus to it as well, because it's, it's a source of money that you can say, okay, well, this is what I've always wanted. I've always wanted to renovate a house with the wife. We've done it whilst we didn't have children. We built this, we didn't build a house, but we renovated a, a family home to, to introduce a baby into. That was kind of our process. Couldn't have done that if I didn't have equity in the property. It was as simple as that. So I've now got two rentals that are just sitting there on interest only, a slow income stream, I'm sure when we have a round of golf in a minute, we'll you'll probably end up getting me to buy another one. So, yeah, we'll see. I would like I would like to get more, absolutely. But it all comes at a price, and it all comes at being stable in what you're doing as well. But you still need to take some risks. Yeah, because I mean, you you took a, a real interest in our property workshops because uh, I know we were introduced to each other, and I explained what I did, and then we started talking about you know maybe some of the spare time that you had available. Yep, and you said well. Could I, could I join you? I was like, well, absolutely, I would love you to. And you, and you did. I mean, I love the fact you came back with me to Ipswich. You then came with me to Northampton First Team. You also came with me to West Ham. It was at West Ham that you really, you took centre stage after I'd done my presentation. And I love that because you openly shared your position where you were at with your career right now, where football hoods potentially stopped. And you spoke to them about your properties giving you an income and they really warmed to you didn't they to the point where we've actually now got two players from that group now at this present moment buying property with us at mph sports yeah what was it about the, the workshops that that gravitated you to think well actually i'd love to do more of this because we didn't have it at that age i think that was the biggest thing for me it was you know you had this this ambition to and you still obviously do but you've got this ambition to try and educate young people in a sporting environment that can be quite cutthroat and you know you just brush to one side one minute it's like it's you it's gone career's gone but how can whilst you're in it how can you prepare for that potential moment i'm not saying it will happen to everyone but it might happen so then when i had all this spare time and i'm thinking i don't really know what to do and so I had a conversation with you around about what you would like to achieve and it just kind of resonated with me that because I didn't have that as a kid can we help maybe some other young players coming through and 
sort of goes back to what I'm doing now, helping people. You know, it's kind of, I've always liked to do that. I've always been an unselfish footballer. I want to help people now. So that was my mentality when I spoke to you. It was like, let me just come with you for a few, let me have a little look what you're up to. Obviously at the time, we didn't know what it might lead to. It could have ended, I know I'm doing my job now at the Dons, but the, the goal at the time was like, can we help people? Can we grow this? How can we utilize an ex-footballer as well to kind of put his story across? And I think the, the reason you mentioned the West Ham one is because it's great hearing all the stuff that you say, Lee, you know, in that room. But then when an ex-professional footballer stands up and tells his story about not football, but property, they kind of listen a bit more, Definitely. you know, and that's not, that's nothing, that's not a detriment to what you do because the way you speak about property is so clear, it's so precise, all about numbers, love that, love like that you talk all around numbers and make sure the numbers are always right. I think that's so important. But when an ex-footballer steps up who's sat in their shoes and said, look, lads, it will get through to 20% of you. You know, the other 80% will be sitting there waiting to go into the Xbox or, you know, waiting to go and meet a girl or this, that and the other. That's fine. Go and do that. But if we can affect that 20% to say, okay, let's have a look at this then. How can, how can I do this? And to, to hear that you've now got two that are buying property through you to help set themselves up for the future is, yeah, job oh, done. It's great. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, honestly, I mean, bearing in mind that was probably what, 12, 18 months ago. Mm. So it just shows whatever we discussed with them on that day, they remembered. Had an impact, yeah. It, it did. Do you think, now you're involved more with, with MK Dons as an employee, that their first team players should be maybe receiving more educational-based workshops? And if, if you do think so, how could you help influence that? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, of course. I would hope to think that, let's use MK as an example with, with Russ, Russell Martin, who had an exceptional playing career, he's got his own business, he's got his own Russell Martin Foundation, he's got a restaurant, two restaurants I think, to very much like business minded, setting himself up for the future, even though he probably don't need to, kind of thing. So I would hope to think that he'd want to do, or at least educate his own players to say that this is football, it's extremely important. You know, I need you to learn about this, 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 and this. However, let's bring someone, an expert in to say, talk about property, talk about business, talk about finances, talk about all the things that uh, when you're playing, you don't necessarily think about until you almost get told, you know, that's how you should think in a, in a strange way. It's a really interesting bubble football. And you, the more footballers you come across, you'll, you'll, you'll understand it. And I'm sure you're starting to understand it now. It's... It's, everything's done for you, especially at the, the, the high levels. Kit's done, you know, what food you eat's done. It's kind of like, you just have to walk, essentially. They even make you run. <laughs> they tell you, run that far, that fast, kind of thing. It's all done for you. So to, to influence them uh, about things, or to help educate them, sorry, around things that are not even football-based, are extremely important. So... How I can have an influence on these players would be just to have the conversation with the staff members first to say, this is really important, really important. When, when you came with me to Northampton, obviously a club that you had only recently had, had passed away yeah, with, yeah. I was only going in because I had been introduced to Keith Curl. Keith Curl, yeah, yeah. And it's fascinating that actually, um, and I now work for Keith, I think we've bought two or three properties together. We've helped him refinance some assets. We know we now have a, another independent plan with him. But if it wasn't for that introduction, I wouldn't have met that group of players on that day. I love the fact that the, the Premier League, um, the LFE are doing so much for the under 18s and under 23s. But if looking back on your career at 16, if you've skipped that process and gone straight into the first team, mm. them doors are almost bolted close unless you know someone unless you know the gaffer well it was my mum well, it was my mum and dad that influenced me yeah that was their education yeah you know but, but that but that's but, but how old are you now i'm, I'm 29 <laughs> 34 <laughs> nearly 20 years ago yeah and that still has not changed yeah so you talk about the highest level i mean we see the shirts behind us you know uh, with scott down and joel ward at, at palace um they've got a fantastic player liaison manager there in, in danny who does 
everything for that first team squad. But I know for a fact that nobody goes in to speak to those guys. And I work for a few of those guys. And even the younger lads in those teams, in the first team squads, if they're thinking of buying a home, unless they have a mum or dad like you, that's so supportive and knowledgeable on their savings, then maybe they don't go down the road of buying a property. They they do buy that car that you referred to yeah. or something else. Which is fine. Which is fine. Which is it's absolutely normal, fine. Right? It's absolutely normal. And, but and, it's the and balance between everything. Absolutely. 100%. And, and understanding the knowledge of what else is available to me to spend this what, money what it, on. What it, what it is for me is what I experience as a player is that until someone comes in and almost makes it extremely easy for you to be a part of something until they do that your players won't do it mm. because it they're, they're lazy mm. as, as hard as they work at their football and as hard as they work at their, their own game and for the team and on a match day they're so lazy out, outside of football that's not all of them by the way you know but a massive percentage of footballers are just so lazy outside of football so you need to make it extremely easy for them to be a part of it you know, where all they need to do is just sign a couple of things. That's the kind of bit that I think would help you get into more football clubs is to have a platform, which you are doing to be fair, but to have a platform that all they literally have to do is say yes and it's done. You know, yeah. make it as easy as possible for them because otherwise the, the majority won't do it. Yeah. There are the minority, there are that, that are so driven around things that Reese Wabara, who, who set up a, a clothing brand, you know, he had a, a business mind where he was extremely good at football, but he just was so driven to build his own business. The, there are players out there that do that, but the majority, if that's who you want to focus on to help, mm. are not. They're so lazy. Yeah. <laughs> so just make it as easy as possible. I think we've, um, at the moment, we've got a, a service where we literally complete all of the solicitor's paperwork for the player. We are their voice. We will not only help buy the property, but we'll rent it and certificate it and make sure they're legally compliant. And that's all great. But I think for us, it's now exposing the fact that there is no real knowledge coming through post 23s, beyond 23s yeah. um, at the moment. And that's what we need to try and change, I think. And it's not for companies like us to come in and perform as a sales pitch. It's not about that. It's just providing with knowledge on how to buy a home, how to build up a property company. I mean, you've got your two investments at the moment. Yeah. I can tell you if they were parked in a property company as opposed to your own name, they would be more tax efficient. Yeah. You we, can tell me about this later. No, we we're going, going, no, we're 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 going, no, in property, yeah, oh, I'd probably buy more. I mean, like I said to you, to use that signing on fee to buy one, then the next one, then the next one was all I could do at the time. But I was buying locally. I was buying in Braintree yeah. in Essex, which is great from a capital growth point. Which is which is really good, and it's helped. Like I said, do like a, a renovation in the property I'm in at the moment. Yeah, but with that same money, I could have bought ten potentially. You know, so I could have, I could be sitting on ten properties at the moment, having that extra little bit of income, which again, as, unless the numbers work, which you, I know you're really passionate about, as long as the numbers worked, then it, I would have liked to have bought, bought more. So yeah, that's probably what I would have changed. I would have, I would have maybe been a bit braver to look outside of my my own area. Essentially, I think the reason I looked locally was because my mum and dad were willing to kind of help look after them. So it was like, I didn't want to put the stress on them either in saying, oh, we've got one in Doncaster, we've got one up here, we've got one there. You know, can you can you go and see to that tenant? It's a bit like, because yeah, yeah. we've always dealt with it ourselves, we've always yeah. managed it ourselves yeah. rather than letting the company do it. So to have them local was, was a lot easier. So yeah, maybe just be a bit braver and, and buy a few more, maybe up, up the country a bit. Cool. 
Dean, do you know what, mate? You've been brilliant for us today. I think just remind everybody your new podcast with our music. <laughs> <laughs> what is it called and where do people find uh, it? Do you really want me to? Yeah. So the new podcast we've got with fantastic music is called What It Takes To Be and it is on all your usual Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor yeah. as well. And just type in what it takes to be or type in Dean Bowditch and you'll see it there. And if you are interested in a little bit more around the mentality, I've spoken a lot about it today, as you probably realise, but around about the mentality of individuals, then um, yeah, have a little listen. But Super. make sure you listen to this one first. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dean. No, I really appreciate no. you coming in. I've loved it. Thank you. Right, let's go and play golf. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to Talk Sport and Property. Visit the App Store and download the MPH Sports app today or keep up with us over on Instagram.